Jack and Glenda. We're from the Media Precinct. Um, and on the next slide just gives you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be talking to. So as Glenda, I'm sure, has already said, we're going to talk about the work we've done for Bowles New South Wales so far, but then more importantly, talking about what we can do at a local level and the things you can do um, you know, with very minimal investment of, of time and money to um, promote your club in, in new and exciting ways. Um, so a little bit more about who we are as an agency. Just very quickly, you know, we cover um, all things sort of media and marketing. So Glenda works very much in the media and research side of things. I'm a bit more in the creative, but we all wear a number of different hats across these six categories here. Um, and on the next slide, we just have a bit of an uh, indication of the sorts of categories we work on. I won't dwell on them too much. Obviously, you can see sports is a pretty big one that we focus on a lot too. Um, and on this next slide, obviously, you know, some key clients, Bowls New South Wales is a big one for us. And we've got the likes of Breville or even Netball uh, New South Wales with the Giants um, Bounce and Amazon Music. Um, Glenda, I'll hand it over to you to get into the, uh, the meat of it. One of the big things about people and understanding how you're going to get people through is you've got to understand that in the background, there's all these human insights that we go through and we work through and try and understand, you know, what it is that's going to make somebody come along to a bowls club. So what we did when we first started working with you, we looked at all of your share of throat. So if we were Coca-Cola, we'd be sitting here and trying to work out who was going to who, who's going to take the dollar that I'm going to pay for that can of Coke. Is it going to be the chocolate bar, the packet of chips? Is it going to be another beverage? Or is it going to be that they're going to buy Pepsi and not Coke? You know, Pepsi's the obvious one. So what we did is we looked at everybody from golf and tennis all the way through to walking, so pastimes that don't cost any money. And then we started to look at, you know, what is it, the social activities that they might be doing? What about the other clubs that are out there? Or what, what about the recreational facilities like a, a local gym or something like council gym or something like that swimming pool, that kind of thing? So where is it that you could actually lose those competitors to? And then what we did is we worked through the population and we identified where we could actually, what was the, what was the size of the prize? Where, how many people could we feasibly get along to the, actual, uh, to the actual clubs? And then we broke that out by regional and uh, metro uh, markets. So we looked at Sydney and then we looked at regional New South Wales and we were able to even go down even lower. So um, mixing a little bit of the art and the science is um, what we do between media and creative. And as Glenda just went through, obviously we use a lot of different research tools um, to kind of quantify the audience and to understand a little bit about, you know, the types of people we should be talking to to attract as new members. Um, and within that, obviously, there's a lot of different, you know, stats and data you can run to. And we learned a lot about different things that might motivate someone to become a member at a club. We also learn a lot about what might cause someone reluctance to. Um, and using a little bit of creative license here, we pulled together um, for what we call bold to egos um, to represent a bit of a cross-section of the different types of people we could see potentially being attracted um, to a club and ultimately becoming a member. Um, so we've got a, a bit of a mix here. So we've got Dave. He's sort of your classic Aussie bloke. He loves, you know, golf, fishing trips, um, off-road adventures and that sort of thing. Um, but he gets frustrated by the costs and the challenges of these hobbies. Um, but the only reason he really sticks with these other hobbies is because his mates are doing it. it just seems to be the way of the land. Then we have someone like Sarah. So she represents our sort of more of our mum demographic. So she's constantly got her hands full between, you know, juggling work and, and juggling kids. Um, she's really trying to find activities and pastimes that can kind of satiate her need to get a little bit of downtime and relax, but also somewhere where, you know, she knows the kids are going to be looked after as well and they're in safe hands. Um, she really, yeah, yearns for that place where she can unwind, but potentially her perception of the bolo might be that it is, you know, just a bit more of a place for slightly older people, so maybe might be reluctant for that reason. Then we have James, so he's a bit of a culture vulture, so he kind of, you know, represents a bit of a younger, more trendy, upstarting sort of um, audience. Um, He's attracted to activities where, you know, light exercise and socialising might mix, which obviously, you know, bowls club have that in droves, you know, it's a really the perfect formula for that when you look at it that way. Um, but, you know, despite his active lifestyle, like a lot of us, he finds himself just constantly glued to his phone um, and feeling less and less motivated to actually proactively go out and enjoy something. So, you know, the bolo starts to look a little bit more like a place for a cheap schooner more than, you know, actually having a role, um, which is what we obviously want to try and um, try and counteract there. And then we have Margaret. So Margaret's more of a, um, a committed member, someone who's been a member at the bolo for a while. Um, you know, she's someone who's probably one 
won a few pennants in her time. Um, she revels in the fun times she has with her fellow clubbies and loves a sense of belonging, um, you know, that the local offers. But while she knows that, you know, bringing new people into the club is really, really important, she has a bit of reluctance herself potentially against, you know, maybe people like James coming into the club and shaking things up a bit really great things about these profiles like you're getting into behaviors and you're starting to get into the way people think but one of the things that we know that they like to do collectively is they like to socialize they might like a drink at the club uh, they might like to organize their own membership or, or memberships on behalf of others and they really are willing to pay for a quality experience now a quality experience doesn't mean that it's expensive it means that it's a great experience and one thing we know about your clubs, you offer great experiences. That's it. And just on the next slide, thank you. Um, that's a big thing, the kind of unifying factor that we found with all these people. It's this sense of community that kind of binds them all together. And with this, we really sort of realised that we need to double down on what Bowls does best and what we promoted. Um, obviously, there's a number of different reasons and different, you know, reasons to believe in Bowls clubs and to become a member. You know, there's only six of them there from, you know, obviously the physical activity, but even, you know, developing skills and the competition. But the big things that we really doubled down on to try and contact and connect with all factions of these four segments that we brought um, to life was these three key things of social interaction, routine, structure and mental health um, and also community engagement. Um, and then on the next slide, as we start to, um, you know, unpack this power of community connection, we really started to understand the motivation behind club membership for these audience groups a lot more. Um, and what we realised with these audience segments, going back to a little bit of that data and the research that Glenda pulled, we realised across this group there was over 5 million Australians who'd been to an RSL in the past three months when we did the research. Um, and of those, 320,000 people had played bowls. So what we recognise here is that it's really important for us to remember that, you know, this broader concept of the local still plays a really important role in the day-to-day -day lives of Australians. And that's not just talking about local bowls clubs. That's, you know, something that pertains to your local pub or or even your corner shop or your local cafe, just your local place that, you know, people go for that community connection um, is something that really plays a very intrinsic role in the lives of, of our audience and, and of all of us, really. So um, clubs and, and locals of all varieties are still very important to them. Um, and I think, you know, we started thinking about this in a little bit more detail and we recognise that, you know, bowls clubs were once and, and in a lot of ways really still are an institution of this ilk but we wanted to really reinstate um, its position in Australian culture as that being that very much an institution you know the corner the local it's something that we live and breathe it's part of our you know it's part of our heart um, so I'm mapping out our creative what we did is we actually started to ask a little bit more of a broader question around what do other locals look like um, in Australia that have been successful? Um, and on the uh, next slide here, we started uh, to look a little bit more about um the, uh, the, the sort of consumer behaviour associated with these institutions. And there was one local that's been really, really successful um, and it's really hard to look past the coffee club. Um, and I know that's obviously a very different um, kind of local to, to what a bowls club is. Um, but what we recognise is that Beyond just being a simple cafe, the coffee club is, um, it's a place that positioned itself as a second home for Aussies. Um, and it's really become one of the most successful franchises. I think they've got over 300 of them across the country now. Um, but what we really realised with them and the parallels we were drawing to Bowles is that their success is that they recognise the power of their club goes far beyond just coffee alone. Um, it really positioned itself as a place for, you know, both the coffee and the club, and it's seen success through those different positionings of, you know, where will I meet you, or it being your happy place, um, or also, you know, where meeting up means more. So the real comparison we're trying to draw here is that we obviously know the coffee club's about so much more than coffee, but also the bowls club's about so much more than just bowls. Um, and the big thing here is that unlike a lot of other sports, for bowls, the competition on the green and the conversation at the clubhouse are as important as each other. Um, and within this, being a member is really a marriage of multiple worlds that we have there. So it's a combination of various physical and social environments that when combined create an experience that really is far greater than the sum of its parts. Um, 
in it being like the the coffee club it's it's local it's accessible it's convenient it's friendly it's reliable it's not pretentious as well um but more importantly you know bolo members gain something so much more than you know just cheap middies and a relaxed atmosphere they're offered a social experience that's unparalleled by any other sport of its pastime um and with this when we realize you know especially at a time where physical community in our society is is arguably more important than ever before um we really recognize that bowls can start to play a crucial role in aussie's lives again in that way um we really wanted to demonstrate that beyond the green and clubhouse membership means more so the camaraderie and uh, and the joy that bowls clubs elicit is really visceral and what we started to think about you know getting a little bit more we were a little bit more ephemeral with it all was that um you know, you think about the applause for a game well played or the clinking of bowls or the clinking of glasses as well. Um, we all start to think of, you know, the smell of the grass or the taste of the schnitty in a schooner and it's filled with laughter, fresh air, sunshine and good vibes. We realise that bowls really puts the unity in community and so the marriage of these multiple worlds looks like, feels like and sounds like you're local. And that's how we arrived at, um, at this creative here, which I hope um, a few of you have seen. So we have just a few different um, mock-ups of this. So it ran across Facebook um, and out of home billboards and also with some um, digital display as well. And we really had a strong split between metro and regional placements with the campaign, which was really important to us. Um, and then from here, the campaign sort of evolved into the next phase of it and working with um, Billy and Tim at Bowles New South Wales, we started to focus a little bit more on the, the key benefits of Bowles too, which sort of moved its way into this, um, this execution as well. So you have, you know, where serious strategy meets serious serenity, um, where it only takes one step to see progress. So we're talking about both the physical and the mental benefits of the game in a far more specific manner. Bye. Sorry. It was intentional because we did try to do a number of, uh, like, talk to a number of different cohorts and we didn't want to alienate existing members. And the reason being is that if we go to the next slide, one of the uh, tasks we were target, uh, tasked with was actually halting the decline in membership. So, so the repeat member was a big piece for us. And when we were in market, we did actually get 5% retention year on year and 5% new, new members year on year. So we did a lot of proximity targeting works around the clubs, things like that. We really did try to do whatever we could to make sure that, the, that we were honing in on those clubs. Did, sorry, did you have a, you didn't have a, no, okay, that's cool. So that's all very well for Bowls New South Wales, but what actually does it mean for you as a club and how can we actually make this work for you locally? So I want everybody, if you can go to the next one, thanks. I was going to say please stand, but we've got a, bit, we've got a small room, so let's all put our hands up. Whose club has got a website? Okay, so we've got some without. Whose club has got a Facebook page? Okay. So who's got an Instagram page? Who's got TikTok or, you know, Pinterest or a LinkedIn profile for the club? Got a YouTube channel, we know, we love that. Is that your personal, like your clubs? Yeah, like for bowls, we know, we know bowls do, but have you got one for your club? So, so there's lots of opportunity in free media space for you to be able to actually grow your club's footprint because it's all very well us doing all this work at a, at a, at a state-based level, but it actually needs some support underneath. For those of you that don't have a website, go into Wix, set it up. It's really, really easy. It'll cost you for a basic one about $60 a year. And it's very intuitive. You can put photos in there just so it gets the name of your club on the internet. People don't realise that Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and all those kind of uh, places are really, really important because in Googleverse, when someone's looking for a club to join or they're looking for clubs near me or hospitality near me, 27% of all search is driven by social media. 
So you actually need you actually need to have, be in that space and have a bit of that presence because it can really really help you. But some organisations don't take it to the level that they that they possibly should. So what we did is, as I said, you've got regional and you've got metro markets, lots of different scale, and you might think, oh, not everyone's got a Facebook page or anything like that. But what we did is we just took Dubbo as an example, because if you look at Dubbo, there's uh, 16,000 households out there, there's about 43,000 people that live in them, and 75% um, of that population is over the age of 18. So they have the ability in at any way to actually engage with you for a hospitality. And that entire group, actually, the whole 100% have a way to engage with you um, by way of, you know, playing bowls or just coming along and watching and supporting. Like there's lots and lots of things that you could actually do in that with that market. And when you compare... Um, New South Wales clubbies and bowlers, so these are people that have got a high propensity towards going to a bowling club or any kind of club. You can see in Dubbo, 67% have a Facebook account, 64% YouTube, Instagram is 48%. If we put metro markets in here, like a Sydney market, you'll see those numbers are higher again. They're sitting at you know close to 90% or 100%. So you, again, they're great ways for you to get lots and lots of exposure. Now, one of the things about social media, Jack talked a lot about community and what social media actually is, is a whole lot of communities. So it really allows you to expand that footprint. And you can see up here in, in what's trending now in marketing at the moment, it's everything from social media and influencer marketing. Your people are influencers in their own right. And they are much more effective for you than buying a $100,000 um, person to go out there and get very little engagement about pretending to be at the bolo. You really want to start thinking about how you can harness because Jill going along to your club is going to have about 100 followers at, at least. Jill's followers are going to see that she's been at your club, particularly if she does it, if she tags you and does things properly. Uh, you have events that you hold in your clubs. So you already have that tick the box that you can actually start going through. A lot of you can, if you've got a, uh, an app, you know, or you've got a way that you can actually engage with people on their phone, think of not just your app. You don't have to have an app. Facebook is an app. Instagram is an app. You know, think about those sorts of things that you can actually uh, adopt to. A lot of you have sustainability and eco-friendly practices. You've got people outside. You've got people enjoying fresh air. You've got things that are happening in your club that is really great. You've got your club list. That gives you first uh, what we call first-party data. That allows you to actually go out and actively market th to those people and invite them to follow you in Facebook land or wherever, wherever you're going through experiential marketing. You're doing that with barefoot bowls and, and goodness knows what else that you've got going on and collaborations and partnerships. And Jack's going to show you some of the things that you could easily do with, with organisations that you're currently dealing with now. That's it. Yeah. And I think as Glenda said, the big thing and the resounding thing that we keep coming back to is this idea of community. We were um, at the awards last night and the thing we kept on saying to ourselves beyond it just being, you know, generally really heartwarming and wholesome and just so nice the way people spoke about their club and gave so much, you know, credit to other people around them. It wasn't about them. It was about the people around them. Um, he recognises that what works really, really well for bowls, it's almost a bit of a cheat code, is that bowls are intrinsically, it's community driven in its heart. And a really important thing to remember when we go into social media and we'll go into some tactics um, that you can employ soon, is that when we talk to people in social media, the people who do it best are talking to people as if they're talking to a community, not a crowd, which seems like a bit of a um, ho-hum kind of distinction. But what we mean by that is that we don't want to look at the audience on social media as just sort of a, a mindless drove of kind of ones and zeros, just random, you know, people out there, Joe blogs on the internet. If you do it successfully, you think about people as being a part of a community and you want to try and build your own community and draw people into that. And I think Bowles does that really, really well in the physical realm. There's some spaces where you can do it digitally that really work in your favour too. 
think about what you actually offer as a club. And, you, and I've just put like a like the black circle. Think of that as your, uh, your club. Go to the top. You've got competitions that you're either actively involved in or that you, uh, you've got in yourself. So, you, you know, think about it. You might have an away competition that everyone's going to. All my cousins, when they go to the, the away competition, they're busy, you know, taking photos and, and posting them on their own social profiles. It goes on to the Russell Bowling Club uh, pro profile. You might have a daylight savings or extended hours or it might be winter hours or summer hours, whatever it may be. There could be uh, those kind of things. You could have a family tournament. Like we have an annual Wynyard family tournament every year in the, in the Russell Bowling Club. You know, it could be barefoot bowls that are taking place. And then you think about the hospitality. Even if you've got a bar that is served by um, volunteers and it's actually hasn't got a, a, a professional sitting behind the bar, you might feature the bartender of the night or you might be thinking about happy hour or kids eat free or the entertainment you might have in a club, you know, of this size, it's huge, or uh, seasonal menus or the, uh, the casino or the TAB, whatever you've got in your club that comes around that entertainment kind of cycle, think about that. So if you think in these kind of little pockets, it helps you. Think about the community. Do you have a kid's playground? Do you have other organisations that use your facility? Richard, who sits beside me at work, he's, he does his soccer prize giving at Croydon. He's at Croydon Club and he goes there and he, and he does all his uh, pride. Needs. You might have a town meeting. You come from a little place like Russell, lots of people hold it there. It could be uh, a funeral gathering afterwards. You know, like it's, it's, it's those sorts of things or a birthday and that type of thing. So think about all those little things that are going on within your community. Getting a bit grabby with the mic there, sorry. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's it, that's it, that's it. I'm, I'm too keen, I'm getting trigger happy. No, um, so yeah, I think, you know, back to what we were saying with that, obviously what we bring to the community in a physical sense is something that we have in droves and we really just wanted to reiterate them to remind us, I know it kind of might seem obvious on face value, but when you actually put it down on paper, what we can bring to the table is actually pretty, pretty damn extensive. So what I want to talk to is just four key tactics that you can think about using just your own social media accounts, if you have one, which I think most people had at least a Facebook page, if I'm not mistaken. But if not, I'd say the first step is, is to create one of those. Um, but within that, what we recommend is Four key steps. So the first one is have a stalk. The second is set your compass. Three is pitch, play, plunge. And the fourth is experiment, learn and have fun, which all sound a little bit vague. Um, so we'll go into the first one. And when we say have a stalk, um, what we mean is sussing out your competition. So looking at what other bowls clubs do and see what other bowls clubs are doing well in this space and trying to emulate, you know, some of the types of content that they've created. Um, you know, we really need to be thinking about what other potential members care about. So it really should be an audience first mindset you have when you go to post something. I know I'm very self-indulgent on my own social media. I like to post things that I like. But when you're posting from a business perspective, I think it's really important to think about your potential members. You know, what? how could we bring value to their to their life in this way with this, you know, this piece of content we're putting in front of them? So... We have those three clubs on screen there and we'll go back to them in a second. But we called them out because they fall into these, um, these three categories. And these are what really should be true north on your compass when it comes to you know, determining what sort of content to put on your social media. It really should be interesting, entertaining or useful or ideally a combination of all three. Um, so in, in, in social media, you know, people refer to really good content as thumb stopping. So, you know, you've got to stop the, uh, stop the scroll as it sort of goes through. So to engage people, you really need to offer them something and it needs to be one of those three key things. So we've got here on the far left, we've got Marrickville Bolo. Um, and we did a bit of an audit on their social media and, you know, they typically get around 20 to 30 likes on their posts. But this one, I think if my eyes don't fail me, got around 280 or so. Um, and on face value, you know, it's just, it's just a nice photo, but when you think about it from the Bowls Club's perspective, they use this opportunity of this brilliant sunset to remind people that, you know, the best place to see the sunset is on the green. And that really resonated with people. Um, again, doing things that are a little bit left of field for a bolo. We had the Greens here um, who did a little bit of a foodie Instagrammy post, um, which got a, really, a lot of really strong engagement. Um, they did a uh, make your own s'more day, so you could come in and make your own biscuits. And they had, you know, the, the sort of videos of the, the pulling apart of the biscuit with the marshmallow and all that 
sort of thing, which, you know, is, is really eye-catching for people on social media and it's that sort of thing that tends to bring people in. And then useful, this again seems obvious, but when it's done well, it's done, it's done right and it really serves the purpose. So this was Middle Park Bowls, actually in Victoria, I'm sorry to say, I know it's probably a bit controversial, but um, this is just a really good example of... Um, of, of a post and they had a really nice bowl going in the background. It's just a really nice, you know, Sunday, Sunday roast promotion. Um, and then on the next slide though, um, and this is something that, you know, really resonates with me because I'm certainly not a, um, a great photographer. I actually often get given a lot of grief for trying to take photos of, um, of my girlfriend. And I'm just terrible at it. But there's so many things you can do um, without even having to get your camera out. Um, so one of the big things that we talk about here is cross-brand communication. Um, and it's really a good way to boost visibility on social media. And it's an easy way to engage with your digital community without even having to have, you know, a flashy photography degree or that sort of thing. Um, so in the age of the algorithm, tagging brand partners in your posts or even responding when they comment on your posts actually boosts your club's visibility to new potential followers. So can I just ask you, does anyone know what we mean when we say hashtag or we say if you're going to um, at the... Because if the more you do, so a lot of them miss it. So the more you do of that hashtagging, so if you hashtag um, Bondi or whatever it is or Fella, you know, and you at Fella and, and get their thing, you get into their social feeds as well. And so it becomes really, really important for you as you go through because it expands your footprint again. Exactly. No, no, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, of course. And I think that's that's pretty much all we're talking to here. And again, it's slightly small on screen, but there was two opportunities here. These are great posts, by the way. They're really, really great. But it could have just been elevated slightly had the Bowls Club responded to a couple of those comments from, you know, Bondi Brewing. I think they were they were pouring a reshes and, and Bondi Brewing Co. commented saying, you know, oh, you're pouring a reshes, you know, what's going on here sort of thing. So I know it seems a little bit cheesy. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but people actually really like to see those sorts of interactions because it gives a really familiar familiar face to what your bowls looks like as a personality in the digital realm. Um, and then building on this further on the next slide, um, we have, um, what are we talking to here? The power of the people. Yeah, of course. So this is still building on what Glenda was just saying about how important it is um, to be tagging members and also tagging other brands that are associated with your club if, if you're posting about them. Um, you know, if, um, if, if members and visitors as well also tag your club, it really boosts um, your awareness organically and it can really expose your club and your, your club's social page to an infinite amount of people. So we have a few examples here where there's people with, you know, quite significant Instagram followings who've posted a photo at the club just using what they call a location tag. So if you click on that tag, it goes to the location but doesn't actually lead to the club itself which seems like, you know, not that big of a deal, but really you want to be driving traffic towards your own club page so people can be seeing your club, your personality, your promotions, why people should go down there and, and, and get around your club. So we had a few examples here. There's, yeah, a person with 2,000 followers who, you know, didn't tag, and that's a missed opportunity. There's, you know, this person here was interesting. It was an international darts player, I think, from Germany. So really, in theory, you know, you could be talking to 10,000 people from Germany who might want to come over to Sydney and, and have a schooner and have a roll at the bolo, in theory. Um, and, of course, you know, this isn't anyone's fault necessarily. These are just opportunities that you can really seize if you encourage encourage people at the club to tag you. So it's a big thing we say. I see it in, in different um, clubs around the place, but some will have a sign behind the bar saying, you know, tag at Marrickville Bolo in the photo. Or, you know, some people will do like a competition to say the best photo of the week that tags the club gets a, a $50 voucher or something like that. So there's just little things you can do that, you know, yeah. Which means that you haven't had to do anything. Does that make sense? Like the other people are doing your your dirty work, like doing the work for you. So you need to think about that as you go as you go through, because you do want them to uh, post and to talk about you and actually show what how, what a great time they're actually having with you and and expand on your personality. Do you know what I mean? Like you really start to fuel it, so it becomes really important. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, beyond this, we wanted to put in something uh, slightly left of field as well. And I, this isn't something that is easily achievable. And it's, it's not something as, as easy as, you know, just tagging people and making sure you have a consistent social presence. But I wanted to use this as an example. So I just thought it was a really good, you know, demonstration of lateral thinking from a club and how they could, again, using kind of cross-brand communication, 
get their name out there in a new and different way. And I mean, this, this slide kind of speaks for itself, but we, we came across um, the Melbourne Bolo and they um, co-created this gin uh, called Friendship Gin with um, the distillery called Here's to Looking at You Kid, which is the most Melbourne name for a um, distillery I've ever heard in my life. But anyway, um, and again, we have an example here of um, what you can do on Instagram now called a co-post or a collaborative post. And basically what that means is that when you post a photo, you can post it at the same time as the other brand. So all of their brands, uh, all of the brand's followers are seeing it on their feed and all of your followers are seeing it, you know, on their feed as well. Um, and this doesn't, you know, you don't have to have a fancy haughty torty gin to do that. You know, even if you had maybe an artist playing at your um, club on a Friday night or something, you can co-post with them. So to make sure that your their post is driving people towards your page and, and vice versa. People who are following your page might then go and follow them. There's little tips and tricks like that which can um, actually have a really big impact in the long term. Cool. So with all this in mind, I'm, I promise this is the last, you know, three-pronged thing to remember. Um, but when we sort of started, we were talking about, you know, your content being uh, entertaining, interesting, or useful. Um, and that's really focused on how can our messaging and our content be of use to our audience. Um, but what these talk to pitch, play, plunge is understanding how your audience uses the platform and playing to that. Um, so... When we think about the way we use social media and how we use our mobile phones, about 70% of it, especially in social media, we're kind of scrolling through idly, trying to find you know, information immediately, something that's going to entertain us or something that's going to distract us. And so for this reason, 70% of the content that we're making should tailor and sort of cater to this very short form, snackable consumer mindset that audiences have. So with that, 70% of your content should be something that people can get just like that. You know, it stops the scroll. Here's a very quick, short message. We've got this on tonight. There you go. Or even, you know, a little five-second video or, or photos of members or even memes and that sort of thing tend to play well in that space. Um, and then within play, this is uh, interactive content. So we spend about 20% of our, our time online looking for stuff and actively trying to engage with, with the content that we have in our social media feeds. This is why you see things, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, the poll function that you have on social media. So on like an Instagram story, for instance, you can put up a question to your audience saying, um, what do you think of X, Y, Z? I had an example, what was it? Oh yeah, I mean, it's probably, it'd probably go one way in New South Wales, but you could say, you know, do you call it a palmy or a palmer? And then you can gauge from your community, 98% uh, think it's, you know, palmy, and then 2% who flew up from Melbourne would say palmer. So that sort of thing is a really good way of engaging people there. And then lastly is what we call plunge content. So that's sort of more of a deep dive when people are fully immersing themselves into your content and into your brand and trying to find longer form information. So that's where you could come up with something like a video, um, you know, potentially, you know, a two minute piece around a day in the life at the bolo, you know, what goes on behind the scenes or, you know, you could even do a little bit of a short biopic on, on one of your best bowlers or, or something like that. So one of the things that you need to think about when you're doing this is you've got to be really clear about who's going to be responsible. You're far better off doing one really good post once a week than trying to do three or four posts a day, even if it's once a fortnight or once a month. But if you set it in your calendar and you actually do it and you, make, and you do it consistently, it's really, really good for you to do it. And don't over clutter. Don't stick things up in social just for the sake of it. Only put something up that looks really good or is, is interesting. There's no point putting things in social media for the sake of it. A lot of people ask us, about, okay, you've been talking about organic, but what about paid activity? You don't have to do a paid ad. You could boost a post or you could actually take that post, put it in there, but only boost good ones and have a clear call to action. There is absolutely no point in going out with a promotion unless you're going to tell somebody what you want them to do. And don't make them try and guess. So many advertisers try to make it so it's like, oh, you know, we'll just be a little bit cryptic than that. If you want them to come on Tuesday night to buy a beer and have a, and have a palmy, then do it. You know, say that. Say, come here, get this. It's half price off, come here. Or you want them to join your club, tell them you want them to join your club. Don't try and make them guess. So it's really important that you actually do that. And please don't forget to measure the likes, the shares, the hashtags or the, or the at tags. 
think about the comments and the followers. Because if you've got something where one person likes it and it's you, and it's not actually, you know, you, and you've got another t uh, post where you might get 200 people that like it, think about the one that you did that had the 200 likes. That is what people want. That is the content they're going to want to see. And I've got to tell you now, it actually changes all the time. So it's constantly evolving. So if it worked once and it may not work the second time, there's a reason. So, you know, drop it and go to the next idea and think about it. So really, really do think about it as you go through. And just remember to have a bit of fun with it. It's not all about being serious. You actually, you're a club. You actually, people come to you and they have fun at your venue. So please think about that when you think it's not just the competition. It's not just the membership drive. It is also about the, the camaraderie that you have. It's all about the community that you actually engage with. It's really, really good fun. So I hope that actually helps a little bit for you all uh, today.